Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for part one of our Custody Guardian Ad Litem training. My name is Jen Massey. I'm the Pro Bono Director at Children's Law Center. If you have any questions today, you can use them in the chat. If you are joining us on demand, you can certainly send an email. <clears throat> for today's training, we are going to talk about just a few things regarding our pro bono uh, program at CLC, the virtual training series that we are doing, as well as um, where you can find on-demand resources and a few takeaways for today's training. If you're new to Children's Law Center, we fight so every child in DC can grow up with a loving family, good health, and a quality education. We serve more than 5,000 children and families each year, and we do so with the help of hundreds of pro bono lawyers. The types of pro bono cases that we handle are in these areas of work, family health and education. Today we're here to talk about some of our family work, the custody guarding the light on matters. These are cases where you represent the best interests of a child or children who are caught in the middle of a high conflict custody case. Lawyers make a big difference in these matters, both for the family as well as the court system, and we do receive these referrals directly from judges at DC Superior Court. We support pro bono lawyers doing this work from screening our cases on the front end to providing materials like today, as well as resources. We have lots of resources available in our training manual that I'll point to in just a moment. And we provide you with mentoring at CLC. So you'll get someone who's an expert practicing this area of law when you take on a case. They will be able to guide you through the case from start to finish, talk through strategy, answer questions, and the guardian ad litem cases that we handle are really great matters to be talking through with a mentor. What is in a child's best interest? That is something that's great for conversation and strategy. Our virtual training series, you're here for part one of our guardian ad litem training. And uh, you'll see we have two other parts. Our second part is on custody law and procedure, really digging into the code. And then we also have um, a section led by our director of social work at Children's Law Center, talking through both communication with kids and teens, as well as an overview briefly in the areas that um, overlap with this work, domestic violence, substance abuse, and allegations of abuse and neglect. You also see that there is a cultural humility training that's been highlighted. Whether you can join us live or uh, see this on demand, we encourage you to participate by viewing this training um, or attending this training so that you can think through what are the client realities in the work that we're doing and uh, learn with us what it means to provide culturally humble representation. It's integral to all the pro bono cases that we're doing, and so this training will be covering all of the cases that we handle. For today's training, just very briefly, we are going into the role of the guardian ad litem. It's a very broad training for part one. So we're gonna cover aspects of working with children to thinking through trial advocacy considerations. So you're gonna hear quite a bit of material today. I do wanna note that we can handle these cases remotely and we have been during the pandemic. So we've been monitoring what the court has been doing. We've been creatively engaging with families and investigating these cases remotely. And we're happy to talk about all of that in our mentoring if you take a case with us. Again, for questions, feel free to pop them in the Zoom chat if you're joining us live. And if you're watching this on demand, feel free to shoot me an email. Speaking of on-demand, we have lots of resources on Children's Law Center's website, so you can find training materials, manuals, and videos. If you go to childrenslawcenter.org, you're gonna see at the bottom of the page a link for pro bono. It will take you to this landing page where you can click on those manuals, presentations, and videos um, to support you doing this work. Finally, if you are interested in taking a case with us, please send me an email. These are fact um, specific cases it's always a matter of discussion to see what is a good match for you and something that may be a good fit so i'm happy to chat and answer your questions and find a good case for you and for the family that you would be serving okay i'm going to go ahead and switch it over to marissa gunn she is our senior supervising attorney at children's law center mentoring these cases and handling them for over a decade now i'm going to stop sharing my screen so that marissa can pull hers up and thanks again for joining us today. We will uh, end the recording at the end and um, engage in some non-recorded conversation if you have questions at the end. Thanks so much. And Marissa, thanks so much. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Jen mentioned, I'm Marissa Gunn. I'm a senior supervising attorney at Children's Law Center. And I'll cover part one of our custody guardian ad litem training. Um, we've got a lot of slides to get through, so I'll try to move through them pretty quickly. Um, 
I have tried to highlight in red places that have special updates or considerations related to the pandemic. Um, but otherwise, there may be some slides that I move through pretty quickly. Um, this training is being recorded though, and everyone will have access to the recordings as well as our um, manual. Um, so anything that you want additional detail or information on, you'll certainly be able to refer back to the full PowerPoint, um, to our training manual, and also to reach out to your Children's Law Center mentor. Um, so the primary role of the Garden Ad Litem is to represent the best interests of children at the center of um, custody cases. Um, the Garden Ad Litem is an attorney and someone who gets to participate in the proceeding as if they were a party. So um, you get to file motions like a party, um, make argument as if you were a party and participate in the trial process just like any other party does. Part of the guardian ad, ad litem's role is to conduct a thorough, ongoing, and objective investigation um, that's going to inform their position in the case as well as their advocacy. Um, and then a big part of their role is that advocacy, to advocate with the court um, by putting forward traditional evidence and making arguments about what type of custodial arrangement is gonna be in the best interests of the child client. Um, this slide just talks about a number of the reasons why courts um, or why people should consider taking guardian ad litem cases. I'll let you review this one on your own, but just know that it is extremely fulfilling work and it's great hands-on experience for anyone who's looking um, to get more litigation experience. So what is a guardian ad litem? As you can see on this slide, um, by statute, a guardian ad litem is a disinterested appointed attorney appointed to appear on behalf of the child and represent his or her best interests. Um, and you can find more about what a guardian ad litem is and what their role is in the DC Superior Court rules, as well as in our training manual. In basic context for our custody guardian ad litem cases, these are private custody cases they're all heard in the domestic relations branch of the DC Superior Court. Um, and in terms of the legal framework, we're typically working with one of two statutes, but sometimes both. Um, first is 16914, that just covers your traditional parent v. parent custody cases. And then there's also 1683101, which covers third party custody cases. So those are any cases where a non-parent, such as a relative or a family friend, are seeking custody of a child. Some key points for the role of a guardian ad litem. As I mentioned, a guardian ad litem conducts an ongoing and objective investigation. Um, the guardian ad litem needs to respect parental autonomy without imposing your own personal belief system. So a guardian ad litem doesn't have any legal authority with respect to their child client. We're not able to sign releases, um, authorizing the release of information, for example, or any type of medical procedures. We do offer traditional evidence-based legal arguments, exhibits and witnesses. You do your advocacy the same way any other attorney would do their advocacy in these cases. And critically, as you take on these cases and um, start to do advocacy and engage in your investigation, it's always important to keep in mind that the guardian ad litem cannot and shall not be a witness in the case. And we'll talk more about ways to um, be mindful of that requirement and avoid making yourself a witness in the case as we go through this presentation. A couple of key practice pointers. I've already mentioned the GAL doesn't have legal authority. Um, a big part of the GAL's role is to make sure that the child's wishes, their express wishes, are made a part of the record. And that's the case even if the GA or the child's wishes with respect to custody are different from what you as the GAL determine are in the child client's best interests. Also important to know that a guardian ad litem is not a mandatory reporter of abuse and neglect. That's not to say that there won't be concerns or even just allegations of abuse or neglect that come up through the course of the representation, but know that as a guardian ad litem, you are not a mandatory reporter. And anytime those kind of tricky or sensitive issues come up, please feel free to reach out to your mentor through Children's Law Center and we can talk it through with you. 
Um, I'll move through this um, next couple of slides pretty quickly. There are a number of reasons why judges often want GALs on cases, and I'll let you review some of those reasons on your own. Um, but know that GALs are, are very valued in these cases. The court um, takes guardian ad litems and their work um, and their positions very seriously. And oftentimes you are an important, um, important source of the most reliable and objective information that the court is going to receive um, and can help ensure um, a greater level of sort of security, I think, from the court's perspective, that whatever decision the judge makes is truly going to be in the child's best interest. So um, let's talk quickly about accepting a case from Children's Law Center. As Jen mentioned, when you're interested in taking a case, you'll, you'll email Jen um, with which um, indicating which case you're interested in. Um, she'll let you know whether or not it's still available. Um, and if it is, you'll receive an email from Children's Law Center that will include the court referral that we receive from the court, which will include um, some background information about the case and the parties. And you'll also receive a sample appointment order and a sample precipice of appearance. So one of the first things that you'll do is prepare that sample appointment order and send it to the court. Um, via email to the judge's clerk. Once the court signs and issues the appointment order and then mails a copy to the parties, the guardian ad litem will then um, fill out and file the precipice of appearance and serve it on parties and any counsel in the case. Um, service for a precipice of appearance, remember, happens under Rule 5, and regular mail service will be sufficient. Um, but also keep in mind, um, this is a convenience during COVID, but is also just part of the rules. If any party um, that's not represented agrees to email service, um, then email service will suffice for your precipice of appearance, as well as other um, pretrial motions or pleadings that get filed in the case. Um, so you just need to reach out to the party and make sure that they are okay receiving service by email rather than regular mail. Um, so once your appointment order is issued and your precipice of appearance is entered, then you'll begin contacting the parties or counsel and start your investigation. So some of the most common first steps of the investigation are outlined here. Largely, this is about gathering um, publicly available background information. And much of it is information that you'll wanna get from either DC Superior Court or potentially other courts. And so, especially at this time, while so many institutions are operating remotely or with limited operations because of the pandemic, I wanted to highlight um, a document that has also been sent to you in advance of this hearing and then is available online um, at the website that you see here on this page. This document will provide you with contact information for the clerks of the various branches of the Superior Court where you can request information about related cases as well as your custody case. So for example, one of the first steps that you'll take is to request a copy of the docket for your custody case. This form will tell you how to contact the domestic relations clerk. Um, other types of common checks and cases would be criminal or domestic violence, and you'll be able to find the criminal clerk's contact information as well as the domestic violence clerk contact information on this um, hand handout or on this web page. Um, so this will be an important place for folks to start their investigations, especially now that you're not able to just go down to the courthouse and request information about cases. One of the next first steps that you'll take after appointment and after you've made some initial contact with the parties or counsel on your case is to set up your initial meeting with your child client. Um, now at Children's Law Center, we're still all operating remotely as everyone I'm sure is aware. We're still um, dealing with the pandemic. And so um, for the foreseeable future, you probably won't be having face-to-face -face visits with anyone in your cases, including your child client. Um, but the good news is that there are all kinds of mechanisms that you can still use um, to have um, virtual face-to-face -face communication with your client or other communications with your client. So I've listed here some of the most common um, video chat applications that many of us at Children's Law Center are using or that we just know are available. 
But the bottom line is that there are workarounds for you to be able to engage with your client, get to know your client, um, and really have a meaningful dialogue and build rapport with your client, even though we're not able to meet our clients in the community, in the homes where they're living, visiting family, um, and going to school. A couple of quick pointers about these, um, especially these virtual client visits. Um, to the extent that you can, as you are contacting their primary caregivers to set up these visits, um, talk with the caregiver about requesting a certain level of privacy so that you can have an open and honest dialogue with your client, keeping in mind your client's developmental um, and their actual age in terms of what's appropriate. Um, and so this doesn't mean that your client has to be in a room by themselves with a closed door, um, but maybe they are in a separate space in the home or a separate room in the home, someplace where they can be comfortable um, and be assured of a certain level of privacy to be able to talk with you open, openly and honestly. Um, but even with that request and even where uh, a caregiver is willing to try to accommodate you to the extent that they can, you'll always want to be thinking about your client's surroundings. Um, when you're on these video chats, you don't have a 360 view of who's in the room or not in the room, who's within earshot and not within earshot. So even as you're talking with your client and all you can see is that it's the two of you, keep in mind that someone else might actually be there in the background, um, even in just an innocuous way. Um, but if someone is there or if someone is not in the room but is nonetheless in earshot, be thinking about how that might affect how your client is engaging with you, what they're comfortable talking with you about, um, and those kinds of considerations especially in your early um, communications and virtual visits with your client, really focus on rapport building, focus on getting to know your client, explaining your role, which we'll talk about um, in a few slides from this one, um, and getting to a place where your client feels comfortable to speak with you openly and honestly about themselves, their lives, their family, um, in order to help ensure that you are able to get um, good and accurate information from your client, and most especially so that you can be assured that as your client comes um, to understand what their wishes are with respect to cu with custody, uh, they're able and willing to share it with you. Um, and then as always, if you have any questions or concerns about engaging in these virtual client visits, always feel free to consult your Children's Law Center mentor. Um, so as I mentioned in the last slide, one of the things that you'll focus on early in engaging with your child client is explaining your role to the client. You'll want to try to do that as best you can in an age appropriate and developmentally appropriate way. Um, you'll want to talk with them about the court process, explaining what that court process is, what your role and responsibilities as guardian ad litem are, um, and explain to them that you're going to be conducting this investigation in order to advocate on their best interests before the court. Um, part of your conversations with your child client, you want them to know, will be about discerning or learning what your client's wishes are with respect to custody so that you can use that information for the purposes of your investigation and also that you get to ensure that you're able to communicate to the court what it is your child client wants. But you'll also want to be sure that your client understands that while it's important um, that you know and that you're able to communicate to the court what your child client's wishes are, that your child client also understands that the court is not necessarily just going to base its decision on what they say they want. Um, and it's also not the case that your advocacy will necessarily be aligned with what your child client says that they want. But you'll always want to ensure them that their wishes do matter and that the court will take them into consideration and you'll make sure that the court knows what their wishes are. Um, briefly, as you engage with your child client and get to know them and their wishes, you'll want to be thinking about this concept of considered judgment. And that's where you focus on a child's decision making process more than what they have decided. Um, and so that's about, for example, if you have a client that says, well, I want to live with caregiver A, um, if they tell you that they want to be with caregiver A because they don't have to do any chores and they don't have a bedtime, that might strike you a little bit differently and weigh differently in your assessment of the child client's best interests. 
than if they said they wanna be with caregiver A because they know that if they live with the other caregiver, they'll have to change schools and school is really important to them. Their school relationships are really important to them. And so for them, it's critical that they not have to change school. And so that's what's driving their wishes. Um, and that might really affect your advocacy as well as your position in the case. Um, there are a couple of additional slides here on considered judgment, but I really just wanted to test um, to touch on the, the high level concept. Um, but this is another place where you can refer back to the slides at a later time or consult with your mentor if you have questions or concerns about considered judgment. Um, the next couple of slides include just some tips about working with child clients, as well as some topics to cover in your visits with your child clients. I'm not going to spend too much time on these slides, um, both because you can review them um, at a later time more fully, and also because they're in a, one of our subsequent, subsequent trainings. Um, you'll be able to hear a bit more in particular about working with child clients, but these couple of slides give you some ideas about things to consider as you're working with child clients of various ages, developmental um, levels, um, and the types of things that you'll want to be talking with your child clients about. Um, in terms of working with parties, um, in addition to explaining, actually, in addition to explaining your role to your child clients, it will be important, especially if you're working with pro se parties and caregivers, um, to make your role clear to them as well. Um, you'll want them to understand that while you are an attorney, you are not their attorney, and that you're not able to give them legal advice. You can give them practical information about how the court proceeding works. Um, how they can go about filing motions or um, how trials proceed generally, but you won't be advising them about what they should do in order to advance their case with the court. Also, in working with parties, you'll wanna be sure to take a balanced approach. Um, when the pandemic is cleared um, in, the, in the future, hopefully, um, you'll be able to engage with parties in person again, but for now, it's fine to engage with parties virtually, um, talking with them by phone, by email. Um, you can even do video chats with um, parties if that's gonna be useful or helpful. helpful. Um, but you wanna be able to talk with them separately. Um, and you can also consider trying to do um, like conference calls, meeting with people together, um, um, particularly where you are assessing whether or not settlement is a possibility. Um, but as you're talking with parties separately and individually, think about making sure that you're giving each party equal time um, and equal opportunity to share their concerns, their goals, their position with you. Um, and you can also do some work in terms of providing parties with reality checks. So if it seems that one party has unrealistic expectations um, on what the court may or may not do at a trial or what the prospects of their request for custody are, if you know that the evidence um, but looking at the evidence as you understand it means that a party's request is just very unlikely to be, to be granted. Um, you do have the ability to share that assessment with them. You, again, you can't give them advice or tell them what to do, um, but especially if it might help parties reach some sort of middle ground or resolution, you can provide that type of um, reality check to the parties um, throughout your work on the case. Um, the next couple of slides have to do with conflict resolution, especially where you are trying to help the parties broker an agreement. I won't go through all of these ideas in detail. These are things that you can think about on your own and also consult with your mentor about. Um, but many of these cases are high conflict um, and there will be opportunities for you as the guardian ad litem to see if you can help parties sort of see through, especially where there are sort of historical facts or issues that are barriers to settlement, but otherwise it seems like the parties aren't too, um, too far apart in terms of what they want for the child. There's some work that you can do as the GAL in helping dissolve some of that conflict and move the parties forward, hopefully to some kind of settlement resolution um, to avoid a full trial in the case. Um, the next couple of slides are about some resources that are available to GALs in these cases and that are particularly useful um, as it relates to gathering information about the parties and your child client. Um, so this list includes, you know, home studies, assessments, and things like that. Um, and then there are some additional services on the next slide. I don't want to go into um, these 
resources and services too much in detail, but I think what's important to note is that these are all services that are available to parties just by virtue of the fact that they have a pending case in DC Superior Court. And most significantly, all of these services are still available during the pandemic. Um, some of them are modified. So for example, home studies are not necessarily being done with a person from the court going out into parties' homes to visit the home. Um, but they are doing sort of modified home studies um, telephonically um, to be able to um, create home study reports um, and other assessments that can be useful for the court. Um, and then the supervised visitation center is even doing virtually supervised um, video chat visits for caregivers that are ordered to do supervised visitation. So um, if you need more information about how to access those services or how to go about requesting those services in your cases, um, please feel free to look through the manual um, or consult with your Children's Law Center mentor. Um, so now we're going to talk about the guardian ad litem's responsibilities pre-trial. Um, we've touched on this a number of times, but the guardian ad litem has to conduct this thorough and ongoing and independent investigation in order to help the guardian ad litem come up with a position on what they think is going to be in the child client's best interests. In that process, you'll also establish a relationship with your client, as well as the um, adult most closely involved in your, in your um, child's client's life. Um, and you'll be thinking about developing your case strategy. So as you're gathering information, records, interviewing witnesses, and thinking about what information or what evidence needs to get before the court, um, you'll also be thinking about strategically what information you want before the court um, in order to further your position in the case. It'll also be important that you as the guardian ad litem stay apprised of any other court proceedings affecting the child um, or their caregivers or members of their households. Um, so, you know, sometimes you'll have a caregiver seeking custody, but they also have a pending criminal matter. Um, and it will matter whether or not they end up being convicted of a crime, potentially sentenced to um, some um, incarceration, because that will affect their availability to care for the child if they are granted custody. So um, as you're doing those background checks and checking on cases, you'll also want to monitor any open or unresolved court cases that you find. And again, you can learn more about how to access that information in our manual, um, as well as on the um, using the handout that I referenced earlier, and that was provided in, um, in your materials prior to this training. Um, the guardian ad litem's pretrial responsibilities also include trying to expedite to the, the proceedings if and where appropriate. Um, and that can include through advocating to get a trial date down on the, cal on the calendar, but also through working with the parties um, to determine whether or not settlement is possible um, and how, if at all, the GAL might facilitate that. That might be through um, working with the parties to go through multi-door dispute resolution center for mediation, but you as a guardian ad litem can also facilitate settlement on your own without the use of a third-party mediator um, if the parties are open to it and if it seems like that might be effective. Um, the guardian ad litem again has all the same rights as a party and so that includes participating in depositions, pretrial conferences and hearings and so all of that will also be part of your pretrial responsibilities. Um, we'll talk more about depositions and discovery later but um, the bottom line being that you certainly can depose people. Um, well actually I guess I don't know if you can depose people during COVID or if that's going to be advisable but generally it relates to discovery. Discovery is an option um, but we'll talk a little bit later about um, figuring out whether or not it's going to be an effective option um, for information gathering in these cases. Um, and then the GAL with the rights of a party can file petitions, motions, um, or responses to any other petitions or motions filed by other parties throughout the case um, to advance the guardian ad litem's positions. Um, as we mentioned throughout this investigation, you'll take a position um, on the best interests of your child client in the custody case, but you may also need to take a position on whether or not your child client should provide testimony um, in, the, in the trial proceedings. Um, and then you'll also likely take the lead on a joint pretrial statement um, that will get submitted to the court 
prior to trial and can help streamline the trial process, um, which is especially important now that the court is operating under modified um, operations with the pandemic and it is slowing things down a bit. And so any opportunity um, that the GAL can assist the court and the parties in streamlining this process or expediting the process um, should definitely be considered and taken advantage of where appropriate. So leading up to trial, um, you'll want to start preparing for trial early. And in reality, your trial preparation really starts the moment that you start your investigation. Um, so at all points, but especially as you're gearing up for trial, you'll be thinking about what witnesses you might want to testify before the court and why. Um, as you obtain and review documents, you'll be thinking about what exhibits you want to enter into evidence um, for the court's review. And you'll just think about what other evidence might support whatever position you end up determining is in your client, um, your child client's best interests. Now, typically, we do advise that you subpoena any and all witnesses that you want to um, testify at a trial or at an evidentiary hearing. However, with the pandemic, um, we understand and the court understands that um, not all of the traditional things that, that happen um, in these cases are going to necessarily happen. And so, um, you know, we would suggest that you subpoena witnesses if you can do so safely, um, and also that you consult your mentor. In a lot of situations, some of the records that you might be, um, or witnesses that you might be subpoenaing are um, professional witnesses or associated with institutions like schools or doctor's offices. In many cases, those institutions are represented by attorneys and you may be able to work with those attorneys to accept a subpoena by email rather than in-person service. Um, so consult with your mentor if you're running into an issue with a witness or a subpoena, um, but just keep in mind that we're all in this COVID situation together. It is the case that it's not affecting all of us equitably or, or equally, um, but the bottom line is that the court is not necessarily expecting that you or one of your agents is out there violating social distancing um, and serving witnesses with subpoenas. Um, and so you do the best that you can and we're confident that you will be able to effectively um, advocate in these cases to accomplish a goal that's in the best interest of your child clients. As you're identifying witnesses and as you're, you learn of other witnesses that the parties may intend to call at trial, you'll wanna prepare your witnesses as well as make efforts to interview any of the other witnesses that may be called so that you um, can prepare and have some sense of what other evidence is gonna come before the court, whether it supports your case or whether um, you'll wanna to try to rebut um, some other witnesses' testimony or evidence um, through some other way. And then always um, keep in mind that settlement is possible up until the point that the court enters a permanent custody order, um, there's always room for settlement. So constantly be checking with the parties and evaluating whether or not there is a possibility of settlement um, the day before trial or even mid trial potentially. Um, a common issue to keep in mind, um, especially as you're preparing for trial, trial and especially when you're representing a child client, is that the guardian ad litem does have a duty to minimize any adverse consequences um, of child testimony. Um, so your role will first initially to be to determine whether or not you think you're, you need your child client to testify um, and to also consider whether or not if another party is indicating that they think your child client needs to testify. At the first point, your role is going to be to determine whether or not you think that child testimony is actually in your child client's best interests and then do advocacy from there um, to either try to obviate the need for that child testimony or if it is necessary um, to avoid avoid any ne potential negative ramifications to your child client from being put in that situation. Um, as always, consult your mentor, but most especially now um, with the pandemic, consult your mentor. Um, there will be a few additional slides about this later in the presentation, but I think the bottom line to be um, aware of at this point in time is that um, it's, it's highly unlikely that a court is going to be comfortable taking child witness testimony remotely. Um, and all of the court's hearings and trials at this point in time are being held remotely. Um, and so 
if it is determined that a child client's testimony is needed in order for the case to move forward, it might end up meaning that the case gets delayed until such time as it is safe for the child client um, and whoever's going to accompany them to actually come down to the courthouse and provide that testimony. Um, we'll talk more about that in a couple of slides, but I think the bottom line is that child testimony is especially tricky at this point in time, but it's, it's tricky under the best of circumstances anyway. Um, so this is the part in the presentation where we usually talk to you about what to expect when you go to court and who sits where. This is what a courtroom looks like and for the foreseeable future you should not expect to be standing in one of these courtrooms. All of the hearings as I've mentioned are happening remotely. Um, status hearings, evidentiary hearings, trial, the court is conducting those hearings through what's called WebEx. Um, I don't know if anyone on the training has used WebEx before or if you've used Zoom. It's pretty similar um, to those mediums. It does have both video and audio capabilities. And so even where you've got a, um, a pro se party, for example, that doesn't have internet access or doesn't necessarily have a laptop or computer with a camera, they would still be able to participate in the hearing just by calling in. Um, the court will provide the GAL and the parties with instructions for how to call into any remote hearings or trials. Um, and the court um, is continuing matters, including trials, as needed in consideration of the pandemic. But they're also um, making efforts to do some catch up um, and to resolve or start, you know, continuing to resolve matters, even though um, they are operating in these sort of remote circumstances. Cases are proceeding more slowly. Um, and as you might expect, the court does have a backlog of pre-pandemic cases, trials, initial, initial hearings um, that they are trying to address at this time. And also while they're trying to process new cases that are being filed remotely, um, even under the pandemic. And so um, just keep that in mind as you're working on these cases um, and you know, use your advocacy effectively. Um, and also always, you know, as we've mentioned a couple of times, be thinking about whether or not settlement is possible, especially where um, parties, you know, may, might be persuaded that it's better for them to try to come to the table and reach an agreement than wait an unknown amount of time before they might be able to get a trial or an evidentiary hearing. And also keeping in mind that it can be sometimes weeks or even months before a permanent order gets issued after you have a trial, because the court needs to take a little bit of time to consider the evidence um, and make its determinations. After the trial is concluded, um, the guardian ad litem and the parties may have an opportunity to submit to the court a proposed draft findings of fact and conclusions of law. Um, this is just another advocacy opportunity for the GAL to say to the court, this is how I think you should evaluate the evidence that, that um, you heard at trial. This is how you should assess the credibility of various witnesses, the conclusions that you should find, and the, the order, the custody order that should flow from those findings. Um, we strongly encourage people to take advantage of the opportunity to provide the court with proposed findings of fact and conclusions of law. Um, and you know, we often find that courts find them helpful. Um, and while I can't guarantee that it will um, help get the, help the court get a final order out sooner, it certainly wouldn't hurt um, for the court to have a couple of draft options to consider um, as it's thinking through and making its own assessment of the evidence um, and drafting an opinion. Um, after your trial, the court will issue a final written um, findings of fact, conclusions of law, and permanent custody order. And your appointment is automatically going to expire 30 days after the issuance of that permanent order, as long as no appeal has been filed. Um, and so between that 30 day mark and the issuance of the permanent order, we recommend that you reach out to your child client um, to check in with them. And once the permanent order comes out that you um, talk to your client about the outcome of the case, answer any questions that they might have and just make sure that they get some level of closure um, with regard to the proceedings. And then also with regard to their relationship with you. By that point in time, they may have come to know you a bit. Um, they might enjoy chatting with you um, even remotely or virtually. Um, so you don't wanna kind of just disappear from the life. You do wanna provide them with some level of closure. Um, and then if no appeal has been entered, um, 
you, you don't necessarily have to file anything by operation of the rules. Um, 30 days after the issuance of that permanent order, if it's not appealed, your appointment order is finished and you have um, completed your, um, maybe your first case, maybe your second or third case with Children's Law Center. Um, so that concludes the first portion of the presentation. This next portion really covers um, special considerations for um, guardian ad litems during pretrial and trial advocacy and a little bit more detail on working with evidence. Um, I'm also gonna move through these slides pretty quickly, um, but again, hopefully we'll have some time at the end um, to answer any questions that anyone might have. Um, so these are just the basic goals for this presentation. We're really just gonna highlight some evidentiary issues and considerations for GALs participating in trials. Um, burden of proof very quickly. Um, well, uh, the, the standard for parent v. parent is best interest by preponderance of the evidence. Um, third party v. parent is parental presumption um, by clear and convincing evidence and then best interest by preponderance of the evidence. Um, the moving party, as always, bears the, the uh, burden of proof. So if this is a custody case where there has never been a permanent custody order issued, then the plaintiff is the one who bears the burden. Um, if the defendant has filed a counterclaim, then both parties are going to bear a burden of proof at trial. Um, if it's a modification proceeding um, where there was a past permanent custody order issued and now someone is coming to the court and saying, I think there needs to be a change, then that moving party is going to bear the burden of proof. And similarly, if there is a um, counter or cross claim for a modification, then both parties may bear a burden of proof at trial. Um, so leading up to and during a trial, the GAL is going to take positions on factual and legal issues. Those positions might change as you learn new information through the course of your investigation. And then at the trial, you will present and challenge evidence on that position um, before the court. Um, we've mentioned it a couple of times before, but you are an attorney as a guardian ad litem and you have all the same rights as an attorney and you'll participate in the case um, and the trial just the way that any other attorney would. So before trial, how should the GAL uh, raise issues before the court? I'm gonna slip these, skip these first slides on this topic and get right to the point, which is at Children's Law Center, we support a motions-based practice for guardian ad litems. Um, you might hear reference to, or in the past even, have um, filed things like guardian ad litem reports. Um, the prior slides talk more about this, but the bottom line is that we think that the record is clearer and that we think that sort of justice is most efficiently um, sort of carried out where GALs focus on emotions-based practice and focus on filing pleadings and other documents that traditionally are used by attorneys to put forward cases. Um, this helps ensure that other parties um, are able to file responsive pleadings. There's not really any such thing as a response to a guardian and litem motion. Um, it's gonna make sure that your record is that much clearer. Uh, and in reality, there's not a lot that you might put into a GAL report that you can't easily convert and put into to a motion. Um, a quick note, we have seen a few judges, I think in their efforts to kind of get caught up on some of their cases and help expedite these proceedings even um, during the pandemic while everything is remotely, we have seen some judges make explicit requests for GALs to file motions um, that are pretty targeted and geared towards um, helping to move the case forward. Um, feel free to reach out to your mentor if you were to ever get a request like that from the court to file a GAL report. Our assessment has been that the court really isn't looking for any information that would be um, inappropriate or unfair for the GAL to provide, but we may have some thoughts about how you can craft a responsive document that's going to um, serve the court's needs and help the court move the case forward, but also ensure that the other parties have an opportunity to provide the court with their um, position or their thoughts on how the case should proceed. I'm going to move through these. A couple of tips to avoid becoming a witness really has to do with your investigation and how you're thinking strategically throughout the course of your investigation about how you're going to prove things at trial, right? So you're always keeping in mind, I learned this bit of information. 
it seems like I might want the court to know about that and I'm not going to be the person who's going to be able to take the stand and share this information. So how will it get into evidence? Um, so definitely utilize records. Um, think about regularly checking in with witnesses, disinterested or otherwise reliable people, um, people that could potentially serve as witnesses for you in the case. Um, and then if you have the opportunity to do so, think about taking a third party, um, a colleague or someone along with you virtually to these visits, um, someone who can observe what's happening and then potentially testify as to what they observed at trial in the event that that becomes necessary. Um, I mentioned previously that discovery is an option. It is still happening. Um, you can consult with your mentor. The bottom line, though, is to be aware that with pro se parties, and many of the parties that we work with in these cases are, in fact, pro se, um, pro se parties don't necessarily have the benefit of counsel or have a lot of background information about what discovery is and what their obligations are in responding to it. Similarly, um, with especially with the pandemic, they might not have the ability to reach out to institutions or other places that might have records that you request in discovery to easily be able to turn them over to you. Um, and so while the court certainly will consider um, discovery um, and, and sticking with discovery schedules and orders, even with pro se parties, they're also going to want to take into consideration where a party um, or when, where it might not be reasonable to expect a party to um, provide responses within a certain time frame, for example, or to be able to accommodate certain requests, um, either for lack of counsel um, or because of the pandemic. So just keep that in mind. Um, joint pretrial statements and pretrial hearings, we strongly recommend that you request um, pretrial hearings if possible. Um, previously, there were some judges that were just less in time to hold pretrial hearings, um, but I think now more than ever, having a pretrial hearing, having an opportunity where the GAL and all the parties can come before the court and preview for the court what the primary issues are going to be at trial, how much time the, the trial might take, um, and um, dispense with any disputes or other types of pretrial evidentiary issues before the trial can really help streamline the process and help the court operate more efficiently, which is especially critical now that everyone is operating remotely and, and sort of trying to fulfill all of their obligations and responsibilities in the middle of a pandemic. Um, keep in mind that as a guardian ad litem, the court will often look to you to help um, convene the parties um, and come up with a joint pretrial statement or a single document that can help um, streamline the process and put in one place everyone's position, everyone's exhibit lists, witness lists, witness lists, and highlight those areas there where there is not a dispute, where things are stipulated and there's largely agreement, and then more importantly, those areas that are in dispute and will likely be the focus of evidence at trial. Um, this is just a little bit more about the pretrial process. So at the trial, um, we've mentioned it a number of times, you're an attorney um, and you act like any other attorney would. And so the primary methods of presenting evidence to the court in these trials is through stipulated facts, documents and exhibits, judicial notice and witnesses. I won't spend too much time um, on all of those points because I think we all know what those things are. Um, one important thing to keep in mind and be aware of is that DC does not have a codified law of evidence or rules of evidence. Our um, rules of evidence are largely common law based. Um, there are, uh, let me just go back really quickly. There are a couple of rules um, specific that specifically do um, largely mirror the federal rules of evidence. Um, and we'll get to those in the end, but largely um, our rules of evidence are based on case law. Um, so, one method of evidence is stipulations, things that the parties agree about, things that are going to help streamline the process and that the court can cut and paste into its findings affecting conclusions of law because they were not in dispute. Sometimes they include really basic information like people's dates of birth, um, that paternity is not an issue, stating this is the mother, this is the father, or a third party's relationship to a child, um, where a child goes to school. Other times they might include issues that could have a bigger effect on the outcome of the case. So for example, um, as you go through the statute, you might see that interfamily offenses are a big deal and they could affect the outcome of a case. You, if you have a stipulation that 
um, an intrafamily offense happened or that a crime happened, um, and then having that stipulation is going to make it that much easier to argue that it is in fact an intrafamily offense, and now we've got this burden shifting and that's going to change things. Um, those kinds of stipulations can help streamline the process um, and save time and allow the guardian ad litem as well as the parties to focus on the issues that are really at issue um, at trial and not have to, um, I don't want to say waste time, but not have to use time to talk about very basic things like who the mother is, who the father is, or where a child goes to school if those things aren't in dispute and aren't at issue. Um, these are just a number of different types of witnesses that you might use. I don't think there's much need to talk um, in detail about these, although um, keep in mind that if you're using expert witnesses, you will have obligations to provide the parties and the courts with expert disclosures um, and other special um, requirements from the rules. You'll want to draft your questions for witnesses at in advance, as well as questions for witnesses of other parties. So that's preparing for direct examinations and for cross examinations as much as you can. Um, interview all potential witnesses, uh, again, even witnesses that other parties might, um, might call. Um, and especially if you've got witnesses that have never done WebEx before, you may want to talk with them about what they can expect, um, give them instructions. For example, on WebEx, it is really important that everyone mute themselves when they're not talking, because otherwise there is um, a lot of feedback that happens and it makes it hard for anyone to understand what anyone else is saying. Um, so there are some little tips like that that you can give witnesses before you might be telling them, here's where you're going to sit. Now you're going to tell them, mute yourself if you're not talking. Um, child witnesses, we touched on this a bit in the prior section. Again, the bottom line is that it's pretty rare for a child, for a GAL to call a child client as a witness. Um, it's probably going to be even rarer now that we're in the middle of the pandemic and everything is happening remotely. But if child witness issues come up on your case, please call your Children's Law Center mentor so that we can talk with you through it. And that's whether or not you think that your child client needs to testify or whether a party in your case thinks that your child client needs to testify. Um, and we can talk with you about figuring out whether or not that testimony is actually needed um, providing advocacy around that decision. So if you decide that it's not in your child client's best interest to testify, we can talk about how you can advocate against that, how you can convince the court that it will be able to, um, in particular, receive and consider evidence of your child client's witness without putting, or I'm sorry, consider evidence of your child client's wishes without putting them through the stress of actually testifying. And then if they do have to testify, um, you'll be able to work with the court and the parties to try to minimize any adverse consequences from that testimony. These next couple of slides are just some um, considerations and decisions that might help you in figuring out um, how to get some out-of-court statements into evidence on the question of the child's witness, um, wishes without having the child um, testify. Um, and then these, um, this slide just talks about the presumption of competency um, and some other um, Court of Appeals decisions about when and how child client testimony is needed that might be useful in those considerations. Um, through, um, in terms of documentary evidence, these are just a number of different types of documents that you might use, that you might seek to put into evidence. But keep in mind that um, your documents, many of them may need a uh, records custodian or other witness to authenticate them. But keep in mind, you can also ask the parties if they will stipulate to the, end, um, to the admission of a document or to the authenticity of a document. Um, especially with anything that's a business record, also think about whether or not those records can say, contain inadmissible um, double hearsay or anything like that, anything that might need to be redacted um, or, or that might raise an objection so that you can be prepared to um, come up with a response. Um, just a couple of um, slides about using social media and other electronic evidence. I'm not going to spend too much time on those things, but it does happen. It's still important to lay a foundation and make sure that the evidence comes in um, in a way where it's going to be credible and you can talk with your mentor more about the use of social media needed. 
Um, I'd mentioned early on in this section that there are a couple of rules that have been promulgated in DC that track um, the federal rules of evidence. Two of them are here and then judicial notice is um, based on case law and we have the citation for you right there in the center. And that's it for the training. Um, I think I'll let Jen take it from here and she can provide um, the date and time for part two. Jen? Yes. Thank you so much, Marissa. I appreciate it. Um, that is part one. Part one is complete, the role of the guardian ad litem. Part two is going to be about custody law and procedure. And then part three will be the final uh, portion of our guardian ad litem training. And that's going to cover a couple of sections again that I referenced at the beginning. Our social work project leader will be doing communicating with teens um, and children, and then also an overview of some issues that pop up in these cases, domestic violence, substance abuse, and child abuse and neglect. So we hope you'll join us. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and pop into the chat, and I'm gonna send a link. Um, if you all could click on that now or see the email that Alyssa is gonna send out, we'd love to have feedback about this training. If you're watching it on demand, we would love any feedback that you might have about how this went, uh, questions that you have, things that may support you. Um, we will send an email out after this that includes, I see this in the chat, we will send the slides. They're available on our website now, along with the training uh, manual that has a lot of resources there as well. So we're glad that you joined us. We've emailed out a couple of um, attachments when you were signing up for this training. So we have available cases now. And what I'm gonna do, because I know um, some folks might want to come off camera and ask some questions when we're not on recording. So I'm gonna wrap up the recording section here and see if anybody would like to stay on and chat with us. We will stay on, those of us from Children's Law Center. Those of you watching on demand, feel free to email me. Uh, my name is Jen Massey and you can reach me at jmassi, J-M-A-S-I at childrenslawcenter.org. Thank you so much everyone for joining us.